Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we focus on day-to-day -day problems in gastroenterology. I'm Elaine Robertson, a gastro trainee in the west of Scotland. Today's focus is on autoimmune pancreatitis, and I'm delighted to welcome Dr Nick Church, a consultant at the Royal Infirmary of Edinburgh with a special interest in autoimmune pancreatitis. Welcome Dr Church and thank you for joining us. Thank you, pleasure to be here. So to start us off, tell us what is autoimmune pancreatitis? Well, it's a really interesting condition that's only relatively recently been discovered and described uh, since about 1995. Um, it uh, presents as potential cancer and so is of great concern to both patients and clinicians, but it is eminently treatable uh, and that's what makes it really interesting. So I've never seen anyone with autoimmune pancreatitis. Is it, is it common? Well, it's probably commoner than we think, uh, but the incidence, if you look at the studies available, uh, is about 0.8 per 100,000. So similar to Crohn's disease, for instance. So not particularly common, but uh, the cases are out there and it's important not to miss them. Okay. And the importance comes from it mimics cancer? That's right. These patients are often referred as query uh, pancreatic cancer or cholangiocarcinoma. Those are the two commonest presentations. Uh, and if we do miss them or if we're not aware of them and pick them up, then these patients can end up with surgical procedures that they may not have needed. So for those of us who haven't seen AIP, can you talk us through a couple maybe of typical patients that you've seen? Yeah, the, uh, probably the first case I was involved in was actually someone who had had surgery. So this was a 70-year-old man. Um, and typically the, this condition presents uh, in its commonest form uh, in men more than women who are in their 60s or 70s. So he presented with painless jaundice, uh, deep jaundice, and um, the other typical features of uh, biliary obstruction. He had an ultrasound which showed a dilated biliary tree and a mass in the pancreas. And at that stage, he didn't actually have cross-sectional imaging. He was sent straight for ERCP, I think because he was deeply jaundiced and he had a distal biliary stricture at ERCP and he had a 10 French stent placed. Following that, his jaundice improved uh, and he then had a CT and the CT showed a mass in the head of pancreas. Uh, it also showed a diffusely enlarged pancreas with a hypoechoic rim and that, this being in the uh, late 90s, that wasn't recognised to be a cardinal feature of uh, AIP. Uh, so it was decided that he probably had a pancreatic tumour, he had a Whipple resection and the pathology came back non-malignant. He's actually fine, uh, he hasn't had a recurrence but he didn't need that surgery. And are there features that you would pull out of that case that you would think of as typical for AIP? Yes, the, uh, when we look at the imaging, typically on cross-sectional imaging, it's both CT and MRI usually show diffuse enlargement and swelling of the pancreas, non-dilated pancreatic duct and a hypoechoic rim around the pancreas and that's very characteristically seen or on cross-sectional imaging. What we also frequently see in this condition is extra pancreatic lesions, uh, typically lesions in the rest of the biliary tree, uh, in the kidneys, in the lungs, or in fact, uh, it's been described in almost any organ in the body now. Uh, and thinking back then, that was your first case, is that...? Yeah, uh, he was referred to me after his uh, pathology came back uh, and actually was asymptomatic and well and hasn't required treatment. I have had uh, various other cases now, I think we've got about 16 or 17 on the books uh, at the Royal Infirmary here. Um, another case that comes to mind was a 70 year old woman um, who presented with cholestatic LFTs and again pale stools, dark urine. She had generalised abdominal discomfort but very, uh, really very vague symptomatology other than that. Um, her ultrasound showed a mass in the head of pancreas and a dilated biliary tree and she then had a CT and the CT was really interesting because she had a diffusely enlarged pancreas which was uh, like a sausage and typically this is described as a sausage pancreas. Uh, she had a hypoechoic rim and she also had retroperitoneal fibrosis and she had strange lesions in the kidney 
which are now recognised to be um, renal infiltrates. So it was the penny dropped at that stage, it was 2002. Uh, this condition had been a bit more widely known uh, and so people decided that there was something strange about the case. She then had um, an EUS and Dr Penman performed that here. Uh, and what he found was a hypoechoic mass in the head of the pancreas, but more dramatically, a diffuse thickening of the, the bile duct wall. She had a very thickened biliary tree, um, and this corresponded with a stricture in the distal bile duct. He did an FNA of her pancreatic mass, and that showed no malignancy. Um, it didn't actually confirm the diagnosis of AIP, but we went on to do an ultrasound-guided core biopsy, which did confirm the diagnosis. So she was being teed up for a Whipple again, uh, and that was avoided. She was given steroids and her biliary abnormalities, and the pancreas melted away. So that shows the contrast, doesn't it, and how far yeah. we've come? Yeah, if you can pick this up in the right patients, you can avoid surgery. Yeah, and are there diagnostic criteria that we can use to help us? Yes, I use the ones produced by the Mayo Clinic, which are called the HISORT criteria. So that stands for histology, imaging, serology, other organ involvement and response to therapy. Uh, you can use these alone or in combination um, and to give you the highest degree of accuracy for diagnosis, uh, histology is, is the thing. So you have, if you have a biopsy showing autoimmune pancreatitis, that's the diagnosis. The others are used uh, in combination to give a high likelihood that the diagnosis is correct. Um, and so if you don't have a biopsy, but you do have typical imaging features, you have serology in terms of a raised serum IgG4, you have definite evidence of other organs being involved, and you give the patient steroids and they get better, then that's diagnostic. Okay, can we go through those then, maybe one by one? So if we take the histology first, yeah. your, your first patient, there was no histology until after until you had a resection yes. specimen. But generally, how do you get the histology and what are the features? Well, we should, at this point, uh, define the two types of autoimmune pancreatitis that we now know exist. Um, the first type, which is the commonest type and was the first described, hence type 1, um, has typical pathology uh, and other features which make it quite obvious. So type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis is the type that the two cases we've talked about were exhibiting. So this tends to be uh, older patients, tends to be males more than females. Uh, they tend to have a raised serum IgG4, they tend to have other organs involved and they relapse after they've responded to treatment in about 50% of cases. The typical histology in a type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis biopsy uh, involves storiform fibrosis, so that's circular whirls of fibrosis, periductal inflammation with a lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, and obliterative phlebitis. Um, and this differs from the pathology that we find in type 2, so they can be differentiated uh, according to the biopsy samples. Type 2 autoimmune pancreatitis is less common. It tends to affect younger patients, and it tends to present with uh, acute pancreatitis, uh, which is unlike type 1, where acute pancreatitis is rare. Type 2 does have a clear association with inflammatory bowel disease in about 30% of patients, which is unlike type 1, and uh, usually it occurs once, then burns out and doesn't uh, reoccur after treatment. Although there, are, there is a recent study uh, that does suggest a potential 10 to 12% relapse rate even in type 2. So there's a lot more being discovered about type 2 uh, as the years go by. Type 1 is much, much more common and better studied. Um, but the, those are the pathological findings. Okay, and the serological markers, IgG4 you talked about? Yeah, IgG4 is interesting. Uh, it was thought originally that IgG4 was the cause of the condition. Uh, it appears now much more likely that IgG4 is the response. What we don't know is what the cause actually is, uh, and though uh, far more clever people than I are working on this as we speak. 
Um, the IgG4 level um, has not a particularly good sensitivity for autoimmune pancreatitis. The, the typical cutoff that most people would use bef uh, after which we might suggest this as a diagnosis uh, would be 1.4 grams per litre. Um, in the labs here in Edinburgh, our upper limit of normal is 0.86, so when we get to 1.4, that's when we start thinking this could be AIP. The sensitivity uh, for pickup of AIP uh, at that level is about 70%, so a significant proportion of patients with this condition don't have an elevated IgG4. If you look at the specificity though, uh, if it is elevated, the specificity is quite good, uh, it's above 90. The differentiation we have to make in this condition is between autoimmune pancreatitis and the other much more common condition of malignancy. So what we don't want to do is misdiagnose patients with cancer as this condition and uh, delay necessary surgery. IgG4 is elevated in about 10% of patients with pancreatic cancer, so this is where we have to be quite careful um, in making sure that we're very, very certain about the diagnosis. Uh, however, it is unusual for patients with pancreatic cancer to have a very high IgG4, so if the level is above 2 or 2.5, then that's highly suggestive of AIP. And so I think the real utility of IgG4 is in pointing us towards the diagnosis, I don't think we can use it as a surefire diagnostic test, but if it's elevated, it's helpful. Um, if it's not elevated, however, it doesn't really help. People have also uh, wondered about can you use IgG4 to predict disease relapse uh, or to predict how a patient is responding to therapy, and it appears that you can't. In some patients it falls, in other patients it doesn't. In some patients it rises before they relapse, in other patients it doesn't. So um, I don't think IgG4 is uh, the full story. I guess perhaps we've come at it a little bit backwards because it might be, I suspect, that you would see or you would have a suspicion on imaging first and then of course you would go to IgG4 Usually, testing yes. and histology. So you would use it as a corroborative test. So the criteria mentioned other organ involvement. What are the typical patterns that you see? Well, it's quite interesting, uh, and in fact we see many organs involved in this condition, and this has led to a more recent concept, uh, not of autoimmune pancreatitis in isolation, but of autoimmune pancreatitis as the pancreatic manifestation of a much more widespread systemic disorder, which many people now refer to as IgG4-related disease. So the common other organs that I tend to see uh, are involvement of the kidneys with renal infiltrates, involvement of the retroperitoneum with retroperitoneal fibrosis, and also involvement of salivary glands, which seems to be quite a common presentation. Uh, in fact, I had a case that was referred to me by my ENT colleagues, having biopsied uh, a man with grossly swollen submandibular salivary glands, and it was found to be IgG4 positive infiltrate. Uh, and interestingly, two months later, he had painless jaundice and a pancreatic mass, which has resolved with steroid therapy. Um, multiple other organs have been shown to be involved, usually in case reports, and if you name an organ, there's a case report about IgG4 involvement uh, with it. Examples include uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, retroperitoneal inflammation, involvement of the heart, involvement of the aorta, involvement of the eyes, and even the meninges can be involved. And of course the last part of the criteria is response to treatment. So how do you treat these patients? Yeah, well we, uh, we treat them with steroids and so start with a standard steroid induction um, and my approach would be to give 40 milligrams for two to three weeks, then reduce uh, in two weekly intervals to about 20 milligrams and then have a much slower taper after that over the next between three and six months. Um, in the West, that's what most people do. Uh, in Japan, they then keep patients on maintenance low-dose steroid at 7.5 milligrams for up to three years. 
Um, Europe, the European centres mostly do it differently in that we have a steroid taper over three to six months and then observe closely for relapse. And the interesting thing about steroids is that the patients have a symptomatic response usually within one to two weeks. They then have a serological response occasionally but not reproducibly. Uh, but the radiology shows a dramatic improvement uh, within four to six weeks. And what happens if you don't treat them? Well, if you don't treat them, then if you have an inflamed organ, the inflammation will usually progress. Although uh, this is a condition that can spontaneously improve, uh, which again is unexplained. If you have persistent uh, stricturing in the biliary tree, for instance, you can end up with secondary biliary cirrhosis. And in fact, uh, it may be that the phenomenon of steroid responsive PSC, which is uh, what we used to talk about historically, may in fact have been this condition. Um, in the pancreas, uh, it, the pancreas can progress to pancreatic atrophy with diabetes and exocrine insufficiency. Uh, and if you have renal involvement and it's left untreated, that can leave you dialysis dependent. And my renal colleagues have a few patients on dialysis, uh, one of whom in fact has been treated with steroids and is now off dialysis. And if you do treat them, is that response maintained? Do they do well in the long term? Yeah, um, the current studies available suggest a relapse rate of about 40 to 50 percent and that is my own experience here. What we don't know is how to predict who is going to do that. Uh, so yes, they have to be closely monitored. Um, if they do relapse, then actually retreating with steroids is usually very effective. A proportion of patients need to go on to azathioprine, um, and I would use one milligram per kilogram, the autoimmune hepatitis type dose regimen. And they're on azathioprine for life, or how long? We're not sure. Uh, studies, uh, long-term cohort studies are what we need um, to look at the long-term outcome of these patients. It's really not decided how long they should be on steroids for, if they should all go on to azathioprine or some other form of uh, immunomodulation, and if so, how long that should be for. Um, I think only time will tell. Okay, so I have a final challenge for you. You need to leave us with some key messages to take home about autoimmune pancreatitis. The key messages would be, I think, have a high index of suspicion, but don't treat cancer with steroids. So don't overdiagnose this condition, but remember that it's there. So if your patient has typical features suggesting cancer, it's highly likely they've got cancer. However, if they have funny things on the scan, other organs involved, a lump in the pancreas without pancreatic duct dilatation, particularly if the pancreas is a sausage with a hypoechoic rim. Uh, think about this condition, um, and if you do, discuss it with your radiologist, discuss it with the rest of the team, and consider uh, perhaps treating with steroids rather than operating. However, do remember that steroids are not a good treatment for cancer. Uh, yeah, one thing to be cautious about uh, is that when we're treating these patients we need to be observing a definite response. So they will feel better within the first two to four weeks, uh, usually within the first two, but it's very important to document that the radiology is also improving. So if we don't see a resolution of the pancreatic inflammation, if we don't see a resolution of biliary strictures within a month or two, then we have to seriously question that we may have the diagnosis wrong and we might actually be dealing with malignancy. So it's very important to confirm a response even though the patient might be feeling better. That's a good message, thank you. So thank you for a fantastic update on autoimmune pancreatitis and thank you for joining us on Digest This.